In my last video, I upgraded my Mac Pro 2008 to Mac OS 14, and it worked pretty well. But I was hindered by my ancient G4 760 and the cheap SSD in it. But I felt like this wasn't tapping its real potential. As always, check the description for links and use the chapters to bounce around. This computer is so old that it's really not worth sinking much money into it. It'd be silly to spend $600 on a brand new GPU when you can buy a Mac Mini for the same price. But for $75, I think I can make this machine much more usable. After about two days of browsing eBay, I found a Radeon 5800 4GB version, not the full 8GB version, for $39 after shipping. On screen are the specs of my RX 580 versus my old GPU. This is a moderate upgrade, but it will make a big difference, which I'll get to later. Sadly, better GPUs like the much more loved Radeon 5700 XT are still really expensive. After my GPU upgrade, I had $36 left in my budget for a faster SATA SSD, and fortunately, these things are cheap. Not all SSDs are created equal, and many factors affect the SSD speeds like memory cell type, the controller chipset, and whether it has DRAM for caching. The 240GB Kingston A400 is a DRAM-less SSD that I happen to have laying around. And it's really bad. In some cases, like large file transfers, this SSD is actually slower than some hard drives. To replace this piece of junk, I picked up a crucial 512GB MX500 for $35 off Amazon. It's a solid mid-tier SATA SSD. Now, I know people are going to ask why I'm not sticking more RAM into this computer, but fully buffered DDR2 800MHz ECC RAM is expensive, especially if you want to get 4GB modules. And I'm already spending $75 on a computer that I don't really have a strong use case for. Since I'm using OpenCore Legacy Patcher, I should be able to upgrade my GPU by updating my OpenCore install to include AMD GOP drivers so I can see the OpenCore boot screen, followed by removing my post-install hacks. After I shut down my computer, I should be able to install my new GPU and then boot up and run OCLP again to install the proper post-install hacks. At least, that's how I understood it. This is where OpenCore turned into a truly hellish experience. I spent two days trying everything. I just couldn't get my original install of Sonoma to work with my new GPU or even a fresh install. I really don't want to bog down this video too much with troubleshooting, but I think this can illustrate why OpenCore isn't a magic bullet and the sort of troubles you're bound to experience using it. When I tried my GPU with my previous Sonoma install from my last video, I'd see the loading screen and then partway through the boot, my screen would go black. Since I needed to install my new SSD anyways, I tried to install Sonoma fresh onto the new drive, but that didn't work either. I tried multiple times with my RX 580 installed. I could get through the first portion of my installation, but then nothing would happen afterwards. My screen would just go black again. If I tried from the recovery partition, I'd see a purple hued screen, and then again, the installation would fail. At this point, I decided to give up on Sonoma and went to Monterey since macOS 12 and OpenCore play very nicely together, but no dice. At this point, I was getting desperate, and I tried creating the installer on multiple USB drives, switching between OpenCore 1.0 and 1.01 .01 on different computers, hoping maybe there was some sort of magic combo. As you probably guessed, this didn't work either. I went as far as to boot Windows 10 and swap PCIe slots to see if my GPU by some stretch had hacked firmware used for crypto mining that wasn't macOS compatible. According to the AMD Flash utility, the firmware I had downloaded was the exact same one as on the card. This turned out to be the pivotal moment. Messing with the BIOS caused a core memory to unlock. My Vega 56 had dual BIOS, which made me search RX 580's dual BIOS, and sure enough, many of them had the same feature. Generally, two sets of BIOS are meant for different performance curves, and one is often not macOS compatible. I examined my card and found the BIOS switch. While I wasn't able to boot Sonoma, I was able to install Monterey. Just so everyone knows, I did try installing Sonoma one last time, but I had to revert back to macOS 12. These are the sort of experiences that drive home that I'm never as good as I think I am. And especially right now, as I struggle to open this beer 
Jesus Christ. Okay, there we go. I'm guessing if I was Lance, Jesse, York, Martin, Mr. McIntosh, or one of the guys that's actually open core savvy, I might have solved this. I'm not those guys, so we're now using Mac OS 12. First, let's start with some benchmarks. I have my SSD plugged directly into my SATA 2 port on my Mac Pro. You can easily double the Mac's transfer speeds by installing a SATA 3 card into your classic Mac Pro. Although, not this particular card, this is eSATA, and it's also SATA 2. It's the only prop I had. However, you'll still see most of the gains of a quality SATA SSD even using the slower SATA 2 protocol. Disk benchmarks are boring as all hell to watch, so here are the results. When using 1GB transfer tests, the Kingston drive appears to be pretty solid. But if we extend the test to 16 gigabytes, suddenly in the more crucial random read and write test, the crucial MX500 is more than two to three times faster. And this is really felt, especially doing long tasks like installing games or updating applications. DRAMless SSDs typically have a smaller SLC cache. Once this cache is exhausted or when the drive experiences a lot of random data transactions, the performance can slow to a crawl, often below that of a spinning disk hard drive. It's really not worth buying DRAMless SSDs and the speed increases are pretty noticeable. I could go on and on about SSDs, but I'd like to talk about the more exciting upgrade the RX 580. Out of the gate, this GPU just works a lot better with Mac OS. This is partly because it supports Metal 3 and because the drivers also accelerate video encoding and decoding for H.265 and HVEC. Plus, it's a faster GPU. In the Heaven benchmark, it's faster than the 760, but it's only the 4GB version, so it's not really great for modern gaming. At this particular benchmark at 1440p, this is not what I'd consider playable. And I'm not even that concerned about ultra high frame rates, but I find anything below 30 frames per second to look pretty bad. You probably can get away with 1080p gaming with this card in low to mid settings in many semi-recent games. Now let's do something I didn't do in my previous video, compare Mac OS to Windows, as one of the great things you can do with Intel Macs is dual boot. This time I ran both Uni Engines, I think that's how you say it, Heaven and Valley benchmarks. I don't want to spend too much time on these benchmarks because you can pause and look at them if you really want to. At 1600 by 900, Windows has a huge advantage. The Valley benchmark shows the biggest discrepancy. It's roughly 75% faster. Bumping up to 1440p, Mac OS closes the gap quite a bit. That said, on the same hardware, Windows outperforms Mac OS by about nearly 50%. You want a game? You boot Windows. That's the moral of the story. Also, if you're curious what it'd be like to game with the most powerful Intel Mac ever made, I made an entire video about that with my Mac Pro 2019 where I compare multiple GPUs and a ton of benchmarks, both in Windows and Mac OS, so check it out. Windows clearly has a performance advantage, which should come to the surprise of absolutely no one. You are effectively getting a GPU upgrade by launching games in Windows. Now for some general impressions. Bioshock Remastered under Mac OS is much more playable than when I tried it with my G4 760. I could actually make a go of playing it on this computer and not have a bad time. Previously, I wasn't even able to launch No Man's Sky on my G4 760, but now I can with the RX 580. It's kind of rough and there seems to be some visual weirdness, maybe because I'm on Mac OS 12, which doesn't fully support Metal 3, or maybe it's the low amount of VRAM. But this is a hell of a lot better than not being able to launch this game at all. PlayStation 2 emulation is also greatly improved. I can play beyond 1080p. Burnout Dominator plays pretty well. I'm able to play this one at 1440p without too many issues. If I were to do this same thing in Windows, it would definitely play a bit smoother. I'm able to play a more simple game that's locked in at 30 frames per second at 4K, but the tearing's pretty bad. You can see it happening right here. When I enabled VSync, it halved my frame rate, so it's either tearing or play this at a lower resolution. This is more than enough GPU to play PlayStation 2 games and have them look pretty nice. When I previously tested running PlayStation 3 games on this computer, it was a no-go with the previous GPU. It seemed like it wasn't going to work, but when I went to go capture the footage, it started working. With PlayStation 3 emulation, you have to compile the PPUs and shader units, and I think it just crashed when doing that. 
Rerunning the emulator a few times allowed it to compile the PPUs and the shader units. This is a quirk that's unique to PlayStation 3 emulation, and when you run a game the next time it won't have to recompile said code, as it's already been compiled once. So that means subsequent runs of a game will run smoother. And you definitely can see the shaders in this game being compiled in real time. I should also point out I am absolutely terrible at this game as I've never played it before in my life. I get the feeling I am not the demographic for this game. Anyhow, I learned that PlayStation 3 emulation is feasible on a 2008 Mac Pro. So there you go. To circle back to video encoding and decoding, the CPUs on this computer aren't the greatest, thus having a GPU to handle video decoding means freeing up the CPU for other tasks, which is great for non-gamers and creative types. Plus, this GPU can drive more than one 4K display, and forum posts confirm it working with three 4K monitors. At least in the 8GB version of this card, although I'd strongly suspect that the 4GB version can do it as well. Just to prove that HEVC is working, I exported a near 4K video that's 30 seconds long, and it only took about 15 seconds to transcode to 1080p. That's not bad. So for the rhetorical question, do I think this upgrade was worth $75? Well, I really thought this video was going to be a painless and easy open lane layup. But the amount of trouble I went through to get it to work makes me think maybe it wasn't. This is one of the rare times that I wasn't having fun and was frustrated for the majority of making this video. In the end though, I have to say yes, this was worth it because there's not a ton of money to make a computer a lot more pleasant to use. Maybe someone in the comments can tell me why I had so many issues with macOS 14 and the RX 580 on a Mac Pro 3,1. At some point in the future, I would like to try putting Windows 11 on this computer. My personal advice would be to not spend more than I did upgrading a Mac Pro 2008 money would be much better spent on a Mac Pro 5,1 as even the single 6-core CPU models are noticeably faster than the best 2008. Even then, there's the possibility of scooping up a used Apple Silicon Mac Mini. As of recording this video, I've seen a few go for as little as $350 on eBay, and they're only going to get cheaper. I have a companion video on Patreon about the making of this video that covers a few things that YouTube might not be okay with. It's up for free for everyone, so you can check it out there.